Hello, we're just going to have a quick look at what MechAnim++ can do to your MechAnim coding. So we'll take this example scene in which a bunch of teddy bears run towards the player and then chase him if he moves off. Like so, standard Unity MechAnim example. So if we have a look at the code for that, the code that, let's say, controls the player, it would look a bit like this. So what we've got is uh, the update loop is checking for whether an animator exists and then it's checking the state names equal to something and doing a variety of things. It's doing something with speed and direction as well. It's a very simple example, this, uh, but it's already quite complicated to read because we've got a lot of flow control going on. And what Mechanim++ lets you do is create a more declarative way of saying how something should operate. So if we look at the similar thing in Mechanim++, it looks like this. What you do is you declare a variety of relationships. So for instance, this function is declared as being equal to speed. So the Mechanim speed variable will be set equal to this function every frame. And the Mechanim horizontal variable, direction variable, will be set to the input get axis horizontal. And then Whenever we're in this state, run, every update, we'll check these two buttons and issue commands if they're pressed. So that gives us exactly the same kind of effect. So using this, we can run the player around and we can jump like so. But the code's much easier to read. Now it gets much more interesting if you change something like being able to make this player fire and then do something slightly complicated with the firing animation. So let's have a look at that. What we'll do is we'll add a fire where the player picks up a ball, it comes out of the ground, it gets a trail and he fires it, but it also stays in his hand for the entire period that he's throwing it. So obviously that requires quite a lot of interaction between the player and the uh, the ball that they're throwing. So let's go and have a look at the player. So here's a script for the player, very similar. We also allow them to throw in idle and then we jump in the run mode. So you can see how we split that out and we've now got a state that declares that in both run and idle, fire two issues the command throw. Now the actual throwing thing, the thing that picks up the rock and throws it, that's all in a different script. It's in this rock control script. And again, we use a very similar method. So here we declare what happens in the throw state. And as we transition into it, we create a rock. And we put that rock somewhere near the player. And we turn off its trail renderer. And then on rock rise, which is an event, we'll look at how to set that up in a minute. So as a rock is rising out of the ground, we lerp it into position. So it seems to appear out of the ground and come up towards the player's hand. Uh, then at 0.24 of the animation, we turn on the trail renderer. When the rock is in the player's hand, another event, we make sure the rock is positioned in the player's carry point in their hand. And then when we throw it, we uh, turn off kinematic rigid bodies, we enable the collider, and we add some force to it. So again, really straightforward definition of how to throw a rock but the effect is quite good because we get this multiple parts of the, the animation occurring and the, the world reacting to it. So let's have a look at that again. And then we'll have a look at how to set the event up. So we reach down. The rock rises out of the floor. The trail renderer comes on. The rock stays in the hand for the entire point of the throw. Okay, let's have a look at the events that go along with this. So we can see we've got those events are declared here. We've got rock rise, we've got rock in hand, and we've got rock throw. So you can collapse and expand them as you can see. So rock rise, that happens uh, between a period of time. You can see we've got one shot, uh, repeatable, guaranteed one shot, which will fire if the state's ever entered, guaranteed repeat. And then we go in and we can see at exactly which point of the animation 
that rock rise is happening. So you can see it's as he reaches down towards the floor. And we can set that using this slider here, or these two times. And then we've got rock in hand, which is where he's holding it. Again, that's going to be between two times. You can either set them or use the animator. As you can see, it's as he goes around towards that throw point. And then finally, we've got rock throw, which happens at a moment in time. It's guaranteed one shot. And that happens when the hand is there. So it's very easy to set that up and configure it. And you can build some really quite complicated things, and we'll have a look at some in a moment that are more complicated than this. Each of these events, you can use it by using that on method we saw inside the code there, or you can get it to send a Unity message, broadcast it, or send it upwards to an object. If you choose that, you choose the object you want to send it to, and so on and so forth. But frequently, if you're working with Mechan in Plus Plus, you'll never actually need to send these messages. Okay, so we can also do things uh, like make objects active when a character is in a particular state. So let's go and have a look at our little guy over here. Uh, he's got this killable animator controller. So you can run, jump, dive, die, and revive. So let's do something only when he's in a particular state. We'll do something quite contrived. So we'll go and create, uh, let's go and get his coordinates a second. We're going to create a sphere, and we're going to move that sphere so it's on top of his head, like so. And then we'll make it a child of his body so it moves with him. And then what we want to do is only enable that sphere when he's in a particular state. So let's put only when he's running should that sphere appear. And we can do that very easily by just adding a state group. And we can specify the mechan in state, which was base layer dot run. And then we can drop that sphere into these objects here. And now when we run it, the sphere is visible when he's running, invisible when he's not. Let's see that again. Run over here a moment. Turn around. There he is with a sphere on his head. There it is, and gone when he stops. Okay, let's have a look at that now inside a more complicated game where a bunch of these things are happening. So we'll just play around with my little jumping elves game here. Now, what we'll do is this little game has lots of different states it needs to use. So, for instance, you can run normally, but when you draw a line, you can jump according to that line. So that's a couple of states. We need to have arrows appearing as he starts to crouch down and the like. Uh, we've also got over here somewhere, if I can just get there, a spider using that state group method. So there's a little spider. He's running around the place. We'll have a look at his code in a minute. Uh, and if I can throw a snowball at him, you see a different mode again, snowball throwing. Uh, I'm not very good at throwing snowballs, though. In a moment, yeah, there he goes. And he dies and so on and so forth. You get the general idea. It's, uh, it's a pretty easy little game. Uh, but there are lots of different states going on and lots of things affecting his animation. In fact, the animator controller on that elf is quite incredible, so let's go and have a look at that a second. So we're going to look at the elf controller. I uh, probably want that full screen, really. But as you can see, there are lots of sub-states, uh, throwing, jumping, walking and running, rolling, bad falling, being hit, uh, being able to hang off the top of something, lots and lots of different states. And then in each of these, we've also got sub-states like the whole of the, uh, the throw here, or shrugging if you don't have any snow to throw. Uh, so you can get the idea that there's actually quite a lot uh, going on in one of these things. So if we go and have a look at the code for that, you can see here we're declaring a lot of the things that the character needs, so we've got uh, whether he's being hit, whether he's being reset, uh, how long he's been falling for, how many lives he's got, those kind of things. We can see here uh, he hangs off a balloon at one point, so we can see that we register a function called tap. Whenever you tap the screen, uh, you fall off um, if you want to, so you can drop. Uh, when we transition in, we start the hang. When we transition out, we do lots of clever things with rigid bodies and 
uh, tell the balloon ride we're leaving. During fixed update, we lock ourselves to the position of the balloon. Uh, you can see here uh, what we do as we die, um, playing some sound, um, after waiting a second and then resetting. Really straightforward, declaring those states. And of course, we've got a throw in a separate thing. So here's a throw, we're declaring uh, a number of variables mapped onto variables in the controller. And then we've got a, a whole series of states where if you're in any of these states, uh, you can touch the screen to do something. We've got a big jump here. That's the one you saw with the red line. So when you take off, you do this. And you can see the throw here, a start, grabbing the snowball, at the release time, playing the sound, until the release time, locking it in position. Also at the release time, setting a target and actually firing that thing. We've got uh, some IK that happens, so that we uh, we IK the hand of the character to a particular position, uh, which is about the direction you're throwing in. So the idea is you're, uh, you can throw in different directions, as you saw, by using the white arrow. So this here will target the hand at that location, but still everything will fit together very nicely. And then at the end of the whole thing, when we exit, uh, we turn the IK position back. And you can see that we've also got uh, IK for placing the feet in throw, start, and idle to make sure they're on the floor. So let's just have a look at how that register IK works. So here we've got on animator IK, it just calls states.ik, which will call whatever state's in the IK function we've defined for it, or do nothing if there isn't one defined. So going back to where we were, as you can see, uh, Animator IK will do something different in throw than it will in start, in throw start or throw idle. And you can see this naming format. So if we have sub uh, controllers, we can just uh, keep appending their names in here. So this is a bit different to the way that Unity would normally name that. It would normally call this base layer dot uh, so start still. But um, in this case, we, we can use a sub layer so we can reuse these names if we wish. Makes it easier to work with. So as you can see, a pretty powerful system for creating that. And then if we go back and have a look at the spider, so I uh, probably haven't got one in the scene, so let's go add one. There's a spider. You'll see the spider movement thing over here. He's got a little shape he follows. The spider himself has an animator controller, which is much more straightforward. He can move and he can die and he can idle. So that's a pretty straightforward controller there. If we go back and look at that again, you can see what we do is we use state groups to say uh, if he's not dying, then his collider should be turned on and he should follow paths and uh, be a moving item. Uh, if he is dead, then we turn everything off. Uh, all of these things will just get turned off automatically. So that makes it pretty easy to, to have scripts associated with things where you can just drag and drop to create the elements you're looking for. So uh, that's Mechanim++, all in all, a pretty simple way of writing Mechanim, makes your code a lot easier to maintain and read, and gives you a bit of drag-drop uh, where you need it. Thanks for watching.